Good morning. Our call to worship for this morning is taken from a book called Divine Conspiracy. The paragraph is about solitude or doing nothing. So as I want to mention, this is for today. It's not for the rest of the week. Anyway, what it says is the, is the following. The idea of doing nothing can be terrifying to many people, but doing nothing might be a blessing to others around us because then we are available to them. And possibly the gentle father in the heavens will draw near if we just be quiet and rest a bit. Generally speaking, the author says, God will not compete for our attention when we are busy. He will keep his distance when we are engaged in many other things. Every person should have regular periods in life when he or she has nothing to do. The law of God has given to us for our benefit and for his that one seventh of our time should be devoted to doing nothing. What do you do in times of silence or solitude? Well, nothing. You can enjoy silence. Just be there and let God's presence and this service wash over you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, that you care about mankind in general and also about us individually. You want to commune with us. So still our hearts, open our minds, enclench our hands and let your spirit wash over us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
you, Gavin, for leading us in that musical worship. Well, welcome to our service today. Thank you for coming and sharing. As you can see, I'm uh, speaking to you from the church today, and Gavin is here as well. So we're looking forward to a good Friday service here at the church in partnership with Radiant City. And so we'll be asking you if you want to come and attend that service here at 1030 on the Friday morning, that you register at the church like we were doing last fall. Uh, you can email the church, you can email me, you can phone and leave a message on the church's answering machine, or call me just to let me know that you are coming so we can prepare the auditorium uh, to receive you and to receive the people from Radiant as well. We're also going to be asking you to register if you are coming to join us on Zoom, because we're going to be putting you into breakout rooms with people from Radiant City. And so that is important that we know who is planning to come and be part of that so we can organize the Zoom portion of our meeting. So it will be live uh, on Friday morning, Good Friday at 1030. There'll be more information in the newsletter as we lead up to that uh, next week. This is our time for family prayer and sharing. The newsletter has a number of items in it uh, that are of concern for our church family, people with health issues and other things. There's also in the newsletter an item there about Philip and Robin Serez. Philip and Robin are part of our Multiply team, have been for years, that is leading our global missions across um, the world uh, from our area here in Ontario. Philip's spoken at the church in times past, and many of us have known him for years and seen him grow up in his ministry. There is a link there to a Facebook Live event that was held this past couple of weeks ago, where Philip and Robin are sharing their journey. We've been talking about the journey to the cross, and we'll be looking at that again today from the life of John the Apostle. But They've been sharing about their journey when Philip was recently diagnosed in the fall with ALS. And so it's a really uh, powerful and moving testimony that they're sharing of this journey that they're on, inviting people to pray with them for healing. But more so, as you listen to Phil, he wants to see God glorified. And so they share the pain and the suffering, but also the joy that they are experiencing walking with their father. One of the things Philip shares in that uh, re recording that I found really touched my heart was it talked about when we believe that gets us into heaven. But when we become disciples and truly follow Jesus, that gets us through life. And so I'd encourage you to go online and to just spend the time listening to their story so that we can be praying for them. They're part of our family. And so we want to be praying for them. So let's go before the Lord now and we'll sit quietly first for a few minutes just so you can reflect. As Peter has suggested, sometimes we need just silence to stand before God or sit before God and to listen to him. And then I will close our time in prayer. And then following that, Gavin will be playing a offertory meditation for us to continue to offer ourselves to God. If you looked at the, and as you sang those words of the hymn this morning, the story is about God's love for us, Jesus' love for us. But both of them had, and this is how we respond. This is how we return and come to God because of his love that we see on the cross. So let's pray together. Father, we know that you are intimately aware of the needs of our hearts, the needs of our lives. And so we come before you, Father, and just open ourselves up to you for your spirit to come and minister into the lives of our people. 
Father, where there's physical ailments, Father, would you bring healing and strength and comfort? Lord, we pray, especially for Philip, Lord, we want you to be glorified. He wants you to be glorified in his life. And Father, we are praying for healing. And although medically it's a death sentence, Father, we know that you bring life and can bring life to a body. And so we would be praying for Philip in this way. We pray for Robin and their, their family as they walk this journey, as they walk it with friends and other brothers and sisters in Christ from all across the globe. Lord, we join in prayer together for your servant. Father, as we continue to reach out into our community, Lord, we'd pray that you would continue to help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, demonstrating your love to those around us in any opportunity that you provide for us. And so, Father, we thank you. We bless you and we praise you for being a God that loves us so deeply, so intimately. And we thank you for this time to be able to come before you, to worship you, to praise you, and to hear from you. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Luke 5, 1 to 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, that one, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out, out, out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't, haven't caught any, anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they got such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am sinful. I am a sinful man. For he and all, all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Zeb Zeb Simon's partners. 
Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and walked. Let's pray together as we spend some time in God's word. Father, we have all been on this journey to the cross. It's been different for each one of us, unique. But the one thing that is there for all of us is the sacrifice of your son, the love of a father and the love of a son for us so that we could experience forgiveness of our sins and come to be called your children. And so, Father, we thank you and we pray that as we journey with John, your apostle, today. May his experience resonate with us and speak to us as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My journey with Jesus started with a simple, simple but emphatic experience. I had not met Jesus before, but two of my business partners, Andrew and Simon Peter, his brother, had. Andrew had been, become involved following and listening to someone they called John the Baptist, who was going around the countryside, calling people to repentance and to a renewed commitment to God. There was a, a spiritual renewal or awakening going on in our community. And one day, Jesus came to John to be baptized. And it was John that declared about Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was Andrew who, when he heard that and spoke with John, went to Jesus and asked to spend the day with him and to listen to him. And Andrew's heart was touched. And he went and he told his brother Simon Peter that they had found the Messiah and brought him to meet Jesus and spend time with him as well. Now, I had heard about this encounter and was intrigued by what they said about this man, Jesus. But I, I didn't have time to go spend a day sitting around talking and listening to him. I had a business to run. I had fish to catch. But to my surprise, Jesus found me. We had fished all night and not caught anything. And so as we were putting our equipment away and cleaning our nets at the seashore that day, there was Jesus standing at the edge of the shore, not too far away from us, speaking to a crowd of people that had gathered. He was close enough that I could, could not help but overhear what he was saying about the kingdom of God. But I continued to do my work. But as the crowd grew around him, Jesus paused and walked over to us and asked us, if he could get into one of our boats and have us push out from shore just a little way. So all of the people that were gathered there could actually see him and hear him. And so that was my first encounter with Jesus. I ended up sitting in my boat, listening to him preach to the crowd. And although I was tired from a long night of work and wanted to do nothing more than just to go home and crawl into bed and get some rest. I hung on every word he said. And even the gentle rocking of the boat and the waves could not lure me into sleep. What he had to say spoke to my heart and captivated me. Barney, when he was finished speaking, he suggested that we should go out into the deeper water and let down our nets to do some fishing. Now, 
Simon, who tends to be the more outspoken person on our crew, said what everybody was probably thinking, and I know I was. He said to Jesus, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And I, th I thought that would be the end of it. I mean, we knew fishing and we knew the middle of the day wasn't the right time to fish and we really needed our rest so we could come back tonight and fish at the right time. But Simon Peter didn't stop at that and tell Jesus to get out of the boat. He went on and he said, but because you say so, because you say so, I will let down the nets. I, I was shocked. I, I was shocked and, and even a little angry that he was willing to commit us to this crazy idea. But we are a team and so I was committed to follow along with him or swim to shore. And that decision changed my life. It was like the fish had been waiting for us. We had no sooner let down our nets uh, than we started to see them move as they started to fill with fish. And we, we began to drag the nets into the boat, but there was so many fish that we had to call our partners to come out and join us. And we filled both boats so full of fish that the water was almost coming over the rails, the sides of the boat. It was incredible. I had never seen anything like it in my life. And neither had any of our companions. Not only had the words Jesus spoke amazed me, but this demonstration of God's power had captured my heart and soul to the point that when we reached shore and Jesus asked us to follow him and he would make us fish for people, we just left everything there on the shoreline and followed him. I would often think back on that day and wonder how my life would have been different if I had just stuck to fishing. How might life have been different if I had just stuck to fishing? Especially in a time like this when I've just seen this same Jesus a man that I'd come to love and know that he loved me, crucified on a cross. Not only the pain of seeing him beaten, tortured, and so cruelly put to death, but also the pain of having my hopes for him ascending to the throne of David and, and ruling over Israel crushed is almost unbearable. I feel lost and completely undone and don't know what to do. But then again, I would have missed out on so many things, so many amazing things if I'd stayed fishing. The, mi the miracle of the fish was just the beginning of the many miracles I witnessed Jesus do. Turning water into the finest of wines at a wedding was like the first really public miracle that he performed. But then as he started to preach about the kingdom of God, everywhere he went, he performed miracles. Healing people from all kinds of diseases. Feeding 5,000 people with just a, a couple of fish and some barley loaves and having so much food that we collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. Walking across the sea to join us in our boat and even raising people back to life. There was no limit to the power that God gave him to impact the lives of so many needy people. He even had the power to cast out demons from people that were possessed. 
It was incredible to witness. But it was even more incredible when he shared that power with us and sent us out in Paris to share the message of the kingdom of God. And we were able to see the power of God work through us to bring healing and deliverance to people. But it wasn't just the miracles. It, it was the message that he brought from God about what the kingdom of God should be like and how we should live in a way that was pleasing to God. He, he taught with such authority and truthfulness and also righteously lived according to what he taught. He could at one moment be tender and loving as he gathered children into his arms and blessed them. On the other hand, he was bold to speak against the teachers, the Pharisees and others about their hypocrisy and their failure to obey God and lead as they should. And, and they felt threatened by his popularity with the people and the challenge he created for them. And many times those confrontations were highly charged and they sought to arrest him or mistreat him, but he always seemed to way, find a way, always seemed to find a way to avoid them, to escape. He talked about his time hadn't come when those situations seemed to arise. So I got used to him overcoming every obstacle and difficult situation. Maybe that is part of what contributes to the, the great sense of shock that I feel right now. And although I spent almost every waking moment of every day for over three years with Jesus, listen to his preaching to the crowds, seeing the miracles he performed and witness the confrontations he had with the Jewish leaders, there were times, I must confess, where I found it difficult to understand some of the things he said. Because he often spoke in parables or used different metaphors to describe the kingdom of God and what it was like. Sometimes it was humbling to assume something only to be gently and lovingly corrected by Jesus. Like the time we were walking all day and having a fairly heated debate among us about whom among us disciples would be the greatest. We, we went at it pretty hard for most of the day. And Jesus didn't say anything all day long. He let us go at it until we got to our destination. And then he asked us what we were arguing about along the way. And, and to be honest, we were embarrassed to admit what we were discussing. But Jesus knew. And he took us aside and he said to us, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. It's not our picture of being first. It, it, it wasn't just me that found it difficult at times either to figure out what Jesus was talking about and, and what it meant for us all. We all anticipated that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom here and now in Jerusalem. And we imagined what that might look like and what our place would be in his kingdom. One day, my mom was just being a mom. And like all good mothers who love their sons and are always protecting them and looking out for them, you know, in their best interests, she went to Jesus to ask him a favor. She asked him that when he came into his kingdom, if my brother James and I could sit on either side of his throne one on the left and the other on the right. 
we, we were embarrassed by my mom's openness, but to be honest, it was something that we desired as well. We, we were surprised by Jesus' response. He said, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. And Jesus said to us, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? Our response was yes. I mean, after all, we had followed Jesus everywhere he went for years and had done everything he had ever asked us to do. So yes, we're, we're ready to drink the cup. And he lovingly responded to us, you will indeed drink from the cup, from my cup. But to sit at my right or sit at my left, it is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Um, the, the other disciples overheard this conversation and were upset by this. So Jesus brought us together and spoke to us again in trying to create another teaching moment for us. And he said, you know, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It was a simple message, but so powerful because it was so counter to how we had thought life should be lived. And like so many other principles that Jesus had tried to teach us, it was so different. So some things about the kingdom still remain a mystery to me. But other things I am sure about. And other things I should have known. I can recall now that Jesus tried to plainly tell us that he was going to die. plainly tried to tell us. I clearly remember him saying to us, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Now, the first time he said that, Peter took him aside and told him that this would never happen. And Jesus made it pretty clear to all of us that it was going to happen by what he said to Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. This was Peter, one of his disciples, and he called him Satan himself. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. But Peter was only stating what we all felt, that we loved him and would never want to lose him and would protect him from anyone. When he repeated this warning the second time, it still hurt to hear this. And we were saddened to hear it again. But this time we didn't argue with him. And the third time that he warned us about this was on our way up to Jerusalem. And he was even more specific saying to us, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. But in the excitement of his welcome into the city by the people, as he rode on a donkey and people shouted his praises, his 
message to us seemed to get lost and forgotten in our anticipation of the kingdom coming like we expected. Have you ever had that experience where you hear something but then ignore it? Because it, it doesn't fit with what, with, with what you think and anticipate should happen. It doesn't fit your paradigm of how things should work out. And then later when you are reflecting on a situation and someone jogs your memory about what he was really said, it, it comes back to you and you recall everything that was said, not just what you wanted to hear. That is how I'm starting to see things as I reflect and remember so many things that Jesus said to us even on that last night when we were together celebrating the Passover. Right now, many of the things Jesus said that night are, are still a blur, but what he did before we all gathered around the table for dinner was, has become a lasting image that I will never forget. As we all sat down, it was Jesus, the master, the Lord, the one we followed, it was Jesus who took off his cloak, picked up a towel and a basin of water and moved from one to another of us, washing our feet. Take on the role of a simple servant and when he had finished, he asked us, do you understand what I've done for you? And with most of the things that Jesus had tried to teach us, there was always a much deeper meaning than, in this case, having clean feet at the dinner table. Jesus said, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What a lesson in humility and servanthood that our master, our Lord, the Messiah would wash our feet, would wash my feet. What a simple but powerful demonstration of love for us to follow. Jesus shared many other words with us that evening and some of them were hard to process and understand and everything that he was speaking about, but one thing was clear. Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us. He prayed for us, even though he seemed to be troubled in his own spirit. And then after dinner, he asked us to join him in the garden and to pray with him. So we went out to pray, and I don't know if it was just the late hour after a busy day or the heavy meal that we had just eaten or the heavy burden of the discussion that we'd had with Jesus around the table. But it was the exact opposite of being in that boat that first day. I could not keep my eyes open or my mind attuned to prayer and fell asleep, as did the other disciples. When Jesus returned from praying and woke us up, we could see the anguish in his face and could tell that he had been pouring out his heart to God the Father. And it was at that point that the crowd of people, including the chief priests, temple guards, and elders arrived with Judas, our own Judas, in the lead and arrested them arrested Jesus. Of all the horrible things that happened that night, 
and into the morning. The thing that I remember most is the calmness of Jesus. He did not resist his being arrested. He would not allow us to defend him and fight back. And all through the trial in front of the Sanhedrin and Pilate, he never defended himself. He had a peace that was unexplainable. And through the beatings and flogging and having a crown of thorns pressed into his head, and even when they drove the nails through his hands and feet into the wood of the cross, he never resisted. He, even while he hung on the cross, he demonstrated love to one of those crucified with him that day. And even towards the soldiers that had hung him there, praying for them, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Looking down from the cross, Jesus noticed me standing nearby. I was with his mother and some of the other women that were there with us, and I was trying to comfort and support them. But he looked down at us, and he looked at his mother, and he said, woman, here is your son. And looking into him with my eyes, he said, here is your mother. I was overcome with tears, but also overcome with the love that he shared with us in that moment. And will treat Mary as my own mother for all of my days and care for her like a son would. Care for her like Jesus did. But then he spoke his last words. It is finished. It is finished. And he was gone. All was quiet for just a moment. And then it seemed like the whole earth reacted to the pain of that moment. The skies darkened and there was thunder and lightning flashed. The rain poured like tears from heaven and the ground shook beneath our feet. The one guard responded, surely this man was the son of God. But what good was it to recognize that now after you had killed him? So I wait along with others. We wait in grief and pain, having witnessed the death of the one who we believed to be the promised one, the Messiah who is going to establish his kingdom and sit on the throne of David to rule with justice and mercy. But my vision for what that means has been destroyed. What I thought was going to happen has become clouded like, like a mist that has rolled in and settled over me. And I, I, I cannot see my way forward. But the words of John the Baptist come back to me. Look, the Lamb of God. Look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Have I just witnessed part of God's plan unfolding? The Lamb being sacrificed for my sins, for your sins, for your sins. So I wait in my wait and pain. But I also wait in hope. Hope that the last part of Jesus' warning about his death will come true. That in three days, God will raise him to life again. I've seen this with Lazarus and others. But do I have the faith to believe that God 
will do it again. Will you wait in hope with me? Will you wait to see the promises of God fulfilled? Will you wait to see Jesus conquer death and the grave? Will you wait for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to finish the work God has called him to? Will we wait with me? Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we journey to the cross in our own lives, may we understand and see that great love. Love so amazing, so divine. And Lord, might we give up our lives, our all, to follow you. Amen. Oh.